The mighty Mississippi River is the theme of this part of my journey, and I'll be following it from here at its sultry southernmost tip in Louisiana to its source in the snowy wastes of Minnesota on the Canadian border. I'm in the French Quarter of New Orleans, Louisiana, and today is Shrove Tuesday, which they call Mardi Gras, the French for Fat Tuesday. And everyone is celebrating not only the last chance to feast before Lent, but also the beginnings of the rebirth of this unique city after the catastrophe that was Hurricane Katrina. You might notice I'm wearing a sling. That's because I've broken my arm and ten bolts are holding the bones together. I shan't be felling any trees, but I'm hoping it will be healing as we go. It's a word that makes me shiver with revulsion. It's the word fun. And here, human beings are having fun with the most capital of Fs imaginable. But actually, it is quite infectious, and the spirit is good. One wonders how many of the revelers here are actually taking the religious point of view and will tomorrow forswear meat and celebration. Not many, I suspect. <laughs> It's a very extraordinary event. It combines so much that one associates with New Orleans. A slight hint of the macabre, which obsesses this torrid and steamy place, plus uh, a general feeling that there is no tomorrow. While Mardi Gras is a resolutely Catholic festival, Catholicism, which came first with the Spanish and then the French colonists, is not really the defining faith of New Orleans. At the core of people's spiritual life here is the mysterious religion known as voodoo. Sally Ann Glassman, a Jewish lady from Kennebunkport, Maine, seems a rather unlikely voodoo high priestess. Voodoo is the backbone of this city. It is an absolute part of the culture. It's in the rhythms you hear sinewing through all of New Orleans music. Voodoo recognizes that there is a whole invisible realm around us. Between God and humanity are myriad intermediary ancestral spirits. They have maybe a, a different perspective on life. One of the things that you learn as you become a priest in voodoo is how to reach into that invisible realm and pull that potential out. In the popular imagination, voodoo is more associated than anything else with sticking pins in, re in effigies, mm -hmm. with zombieism, mm -hmm. with curses, mm -hmm. with slaughtering cockerels and white chickens <laughs> and having blood. I mean, it's considered a very dark religion, isn't it? Well, it's completely erroneous. Voodoo is a mix of African traditions that came yeah. over with slavery into the New World. It encountered European Catholicism and Native American practices and also masonry. So voodoo is really a gumbo of all of those different traditions. I'm no more a believer in the power of voodoo than in the power of the Virgin Mary, but my arm is hurting and I recognize a good placebo when I see one. I think that New Orleans, because of the presence of voodoo here, has a chance of surviving Katrina. Because really? voodoo is a religion that allowed people to endure what was truly unendurable, the, the conditions of slavery and gave them the strength and, and the resilience and the creativity to survive whatever happened to them. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina screamed in and destroyed much of New Orleans when the levees, these high banks that hold back the Mississippi and the lakes around the city, broke. 
nowhere felt the immediate and long-term effects of the hurricane more than the predominantly black Lower Ninth Ward, a district of New Orleans that lies below the main canal. 90% of the houses were destroyed, and three years on, practically nothing has been done to rebuild the community. I meet up with Isaiah, who was on his second tour of duty with the US Marines in Iraq when the storm hit. You know, when I came back home, I would have like these flashes in my mind, you know, because I used to walk, I used to roam these streets, you know, my school's right back here. So Ooh, that's man, the school this, there? Yeah, this is Alfred Lawless. <laughs> Good Lord. Oh, there it is, it's a senior high school. And this is how Iraq is. Bunch of torn down buildings, grass, you know, grown sky high. The streets ridiculously, you know, undrivable, you know? Yeah. yeah. Desolate, quiet, you know? I feel like I'm on a patrol right now. And then what made it worse was seeing these, you know, seeing the, the National Guard riding around in their Humvees, you know? Oh, here, yeah, yes. Yeah, here, yeah, they still right. do. They patrol around in the Humvees and there's just no need for that escalation of force because number one, nobody's here. If this was a middle-class white neighborhood, I cannot believe it, it would, would be in this situation. It would not be in this situation. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I love I love the United States of America, you know? I, I love my country. But, you know, when you look at the name, the United States of America, I mean, here, I don't, I hardly see unity, you know? I leave the French Quarter cleansed of its revelries, safe on its high ground, secure in its history, and proud of its un-Americanness, to start my journey northwards, up the Mississippi, the river that runs through the heart of this great country. The sheer scale of the river is overwhelming. It disgorges half a million cubic feet per second, and in places is more than a mile wide. Old Man River is also a great defining line. Americans often identify a place by its being east or west of the Mississippi. I'll be traveling more than a thousand miles along its banks, and then through the Midwestern plains to the Great Lakes and their big cities of Detroit and Chicago, until I approach the river's source in Minnesota. Well, one thing you can say for certain about the state of Louisiana, and that is it's always been pretty hard on its criminals. And the state penitentiary of Louisiana has a name that has struck fear into the heart of hardened lifers everywhere. Angola State Penitentiary, it's called. It's probably the most notorious jail in America. It's a hopeless place, quite literally. Just about 90% of the prisoners have no hope of parole. They will end their lives in Angola. Angola prison is popularly known as the farm for good reason. Its 5,000 inmates, the majority in for murder, are spread out on its 18,000 acres to work the land, and they're housed in a series of camps. Warden Burl Kane, who runs the prison, is a legendary figure in the American penal system. We're going to go in the main prison here through all these gates. You're not carrying any knives or guns, are you? No, we're not. No. Okay, I'm going to keep you with me, so yeah. we're going to be cool here, no, but we're going to not do all the searching. There's more human suffering on this land than probably anywhere in America. When he came here 13 years ago, Angola was a cesspit of gangs, drugs, and terrible violence. Today, it's become a model of how a prison can work, one he is proud to show off to me. We yes. just passed Death Row back there, too, at that, that other place. Death Row down there? Yeah. And we have a coffin maker that makes coffins. We almost bury more people than we release. Oh, well, I'm tired and so weary, but I must go along. Burl Kane's vision for the prisoner's rehabilitation is a curious mix of Christian morality, good old boy paternalism, and stern liberalism. We got to live life here and we got to have hope where there's no hope, and we found morality in religion. We don't care what religion, we just look for morality. Moral people are criminals. 
It's real yeah. simple in life. Yeah. The moral are not criminals. Yeah. They don't rape, pilfer, and steal. The immoral is what are the criminals. So we can change the inmates to be moral people, then we have really rehabilitated them. Where the mornings are white and the land and the night. Every inmate here has a job, and that gives them meaning and purpose in life. You think that a prisoner who murdered somebody did this, and it's his way to give back and say, I'm sorry, you know, and, I, and I'm asking forgiveness for what I did, so horrible. Yeah. This man is not going to be prone to, to commit the violence he did in the past. And you'd do it for nothing, wouldn't you? Yes, sir. I'm bragging on you, you hear that? Thank you, Lord. That's a Pete Actry. All right. Uh huh. Yeah. That's why I build them kind of strong, you know. Yeah. I test ride them to make sure. Right. <laughs> do, you, do you really? If I can fit it. Now. Yeah. No, that, that one, one you I probably have a trouble. No, I can't trouble. fit that. I've been in Golden now uh, ten years. Ten years. Do you yeah. mind me asking what 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 you did to bring you here? Yeah, I'm on a drug charge. A drug charge. Yeah. 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 But you're off the drugs now, are you? Yeah. You're clean. Yeah, yeah I'm clean, clean, sure. It's, is it a clean prison here? Uh, pretty yeah, much. Pretty, pretty much, yeah. you know. There will be peace in the valley for me. There will be peace. And there's a field line coming to work. See how they're lined oh, up yes. marching? Yeah. And they're going out and they have a guy walking oh, in front. My, my. And we raise everything we eat. We don't open a can. So I don't do chain gangs. That's why I have the correctional officer with a gun. Yeah. And, you know, if they run away, we're going to shoot a warning shot, and the next shot, we're going to shoot the wound. Just shoot the gun. Yeah. You know, I don't just sh make the noise. But if they don't shoot, the other inmates will think they won't, and they'll all try to climb the fence. So shoot the gun. I have 88 on death row. They don't go out to work. No. I would be afraid they would try to run away to commit suicide by making us shoot them. There will be peace in the there's repercussions if you aren't good. You're going to lose some privileges you really don't want to lose. Driving through his mini state, it might seem that security is pretty lax, but Warden Burl soon puts me straight. But there's 18,000 acres here. This is as large as a Manhattan Island, so uh, it's hard to get away from us. you got to run a long way before you get on the somebody yeah. else's land. See where the hog, wild hogs root right there on the side of the levee, all that red wild hog. You have wild hogs here? Uh, the wild hogs are dangerous. If you go in the woods, an inmate see that, and they know if they run in these woods, they gotta go through the, the, the rattlesnakes. You have the panther, and you have the, the bear, and you have the wild hogs. We see alligators here. We oh, have really? a lot of alligators. That's another and, thing and, to stop and, you escaping. Yeah, and the alligators are my guards. Yeah. They all know they're here, so they know they're guards. So I had too many guards. <laughs> The alligators like to eat dogs, so when we run the bloodhounds, we don't want them chasing the dogs. We have the finest bloodhounds in the country. We can find you. Should we set the Sandman or somebody, maybe the director, actually, JP, should we just send him off into the woods and get him chased? That way yeah, I'd love we can to find see him. That. If he runs away, I promise you, you'll have him back on He has the, a very strong smell, I know that. To England. Yeah, I, I could follow him, actually. There will be peace in a I escape the seductive, if sometimes indecipherable, southern drawl of Warden Burl, who seems to have stepped straight out of a Tennessee Williams play, and leaving Louisiana, drive to the old cotton town of Natchez, the architectural jewel in the state of Mississippi. This is the town of Natchez, one of the great, well-preserved southern towns. filled with antebellum homes, pre-Civil War houses, got rich on cotton and slavery. This journey has taken me up the great highway that goes all the way, more or less, alongside the Mississippi from New Orleans to Chicago, Route 61. in the middle of it, one finds this place, Clarksdale, Mississippi, which stars itself the home of the blues. 
So many of the great blues musicians were born here and around here. One of those magical and inexplicable places, rather like, I don't know, Salzburg. Why should Mozart and Schubert and Haydn all come from a small town in Austria? Why should perhaps the most influential music form of the 20th century have come from this, frankly, rather desolate, dirt poor place, Clarksdale, Mississippi? Seems like the middle of nowhere. Maybe all it has left to live on is the former glory of its music. But there is someone who wants to glory in this past. Ground Zero is Oscar-winning actor Morgan Freeman's club. I thought when I went to school that a remember, Delta... Remember, I... you're talking to a 70-year-old. I mean, that, that, you know, <laughs> So that. you, you're the wisest man in the universe. We all know that. Oh. You played God twice, for heaven's yeah, sake. You can't be wiser. They call this the Delta because, although it is a uh, it, it is an alluvian plain, right? The Mississippi River used to flood regularly. This whole area. This whole area. So there is all of this alluvian soil here. It right. is extraordinarily rich. Yeah. So that's why they call it Delta. Cotton was yeah. king in the Delta for many, 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 because now we have machines that can do the work of a thousand men in a day. Uh, and, and so you've got a huge population out of work. You have a huge population out of work. Huge. I mean, the point for you is that we have to forget the... I'm uh, not forget the past. That's nonsense. I'm, no, no, I don't mean that. No, 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 what I mean is we, we no longer we're talk about... Yeah, we transcend it. That's a good word. Yes. We don't have to talk in terms of black and white, in terms of oppressed and oppressor. No. We have to start thinking about Americans, about st state citizens. The, you know, you sound everyone. Like Barack Obama. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's yes, I, I, well, I guess it's his time. Well, that is come, a subtle know. segue. But they, <laughs> <laughs> Something motivated you to come back. To, to, yes, to come back. Yeah. Was it was it a sense of putting something back into a community? No, it wasn't at all. Uh, I'm going to be honest about it. Uh, it was it was a realization of um, where my peace was in life. Every time I came, there was a sense that I got of peace. Yeah. Quietude. A little envious of Morgan's quietude, I head into the state of Arkansas and a taste of the river as I pursue my ambitious goal of visiting every state. Essentially, of course, all the water of central continental United States drains in, into this river, doesn't it? it Everything is. in between Appalachia and the Rockies. And all the way up into the Canadian prairies. John Rusky understands the allure of the Mississippi and runs courses in rivercraft for urban kids. It'll sure humble you. Oh, I was born in the Rocky Mountains, and I've never been anywhere that I've felt the power of God. More than here? Than here. Really? I've climbed 14 years. I've been to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and back up, nowhere else. It's interesting. It seems so gentle now. It's a real old man river kind of feel. It just right. keeps rolling along. John is very much in the tradition of Mark Twain's great literary creation, Huckleberry Finn, whose adventures traveling the steamboats encapsulate a particularly American sense of restless freedom. What is it about Huck Finn's? 
seems to capture the American imagination almost more than any other book. Yeah. We have such a uh, rootless and restless attitude in this country. Mm. We love looking at the horizon and seeing what's beyond, you know? Yeah. There's always something at the end of the rainbow. You've got to keep traveling, keep going forward. Anyone who goes to the edge of the river is always looking downstream, wondering where the river goes. Mm. Every time I'm away from here, I'm always thinking about the Mississippi River. Really? Mm -hmm. So although it's a place you move along, the whole Mississippi is your home, is it? Seems like, yeah. yeah. You can go anywhere on the, in the last thousand miles of the river, the lower Mississippi, and you feel the same thing. It's these places, big open spaces. And, yeah, here we are, and almost nobody passes us. We've been here out on the river for some hours now, yeah. getting here and eating and preparing food. Yeah. And it's completely peaceful. In some ways, they're frightened of the river. People are terrified of the river. Yeah. And the closer that you live to the river, the people that are, live just over the levee, they're the ones who are most scared of it. With good reason. With good reason. Three hundred miles further upstream, the city of St. Louis, Missouri. It's where the Mississippi River meets the Missouri River, linking over 5,000 miles of river that unite the Rockies, the Great Lakes, and the Appalachian Mountains. Although I've only driven a few hundred miles north, it suddenly turned very cold. I'm driving to an area that was once the transport hub of the country. The long abandoned stockyards were also the home for many, many years of my guide, William. One of the most unimaginable things about being homeless here is just simply the temperature. I mean, today we're minus five or something, and it gets a lot colder than that, doesn't it? Well, well yeah. You know, uh, when I was standing in uh, the abandoned buildings, the inside temperatures are a lot colder than the outside temperatures. Yeah. It's about 20 degrees uh, colder so inside. How, how did you keep warm when you were homeless? Then? Blankets and a whole lot of clothes. Yeah. How many years were you homeless for, William? 25. 25 years? Practically half of my life. In this building particularly, you had about well, I guess about 20, 20, 25 people living there. And you had uh, different agencies that would come through here and bring you food, bring you uh, the oil for the kerosene heaters. Right. You know, you didn't, you didn't really want for nothing. That's why, you know, you almost didn't want to leave. It was just like being in your own apartment, just when you didn't have no heat. <laughs> <laughs> River Front Hilton. River Front Hilton. <laughs> That's what we called it. Because there was so many people living here, it was just like a hotel. Yeah. Fire, how wonderful. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hey. How y'all doing today? Hi. Stephen. Harry. Harry, how do you do? How long have you been together? Three years. Oh, wow. And so is this is this two years too long? <laughs> no, no. So a bitch from hell when she gets drunk. <laughs> but other other than that, she's all right. You got a house. You might as well say it's a house. We got you two bedrooms. Here. Yeah. This is where you live at. This is where you will make your home at. Must be so hard. No, it's not that bad. No, it's not that bad. I was thinking I couldn't survive a day. <laughs> No, oh, I'm soft and fat you and... Pussy. Yeah, I know exactly what I am. Remember that day you hit that dude in his mouth? Yep. For you, calling you. her a homeless crackhead whore? I bounced him off the cobblestone and into a dumpster and off my knee, and I said, that ain't gonna happen. You don't disrespect anybody. That's like my little sister. Yeah. Yeah. Just like my brother-in-law. They treat well, us they, like they... shit because we're homeless. We mm -hmm. choose to live like this. So you don't share the American dream if the American dream means getting your own house and yard and your own kind of mortgage and, uh, and, and you know, the seven TVs mm -hmm. and... Been there and done You've that. You've done that. 
Panhandlers, hobos and bums are very much part of American history and folklore. That sense of freedom that the sheer vastness of the country can evoke, perhaps, makes the American dream less about 2.4 children and a house in the burbs than the lure of the open road. Midwestern state that's the birthplace of John Wayne and James Tiberius Kirk, captain of the United States ship Enterprise. But I've come here to go to a remarkable city which has its own currency and uses as its constitution, apparently, the constitution of the universe in order to guarantee perfect order. Intriguing, isn't it? Certainly pretty orderly so far. Quite a lot of harmony about, I notice. And very little negative energy, which is highly pleasing. Because I hate negative energy. Oh, it sets me in a roar. Can't bear it. I'm very positive at the moment. I've got this healing, holistic, natural energy. It's the only word I can use. Places turning me into a babbling merchant of drivel. <laughs> Maharishi Vedic City is the world center for transcendental meditation, an ancient form of yoga interpreted by the modern Maharishi who taught the Beatles. By activating alpha brain waves, inner harmony is promoted. The practitioners believe that TM, as it's often called, is the answer to both one's personal and all the world's problems. Golly. Hard to tell what's going on behind closed eyes. Perhaps illumination will be found with Dr. Fred Travis, who's head of the research institute here at the so-called capital of the global country of world peace. My alpha waves are to be tested, as well as my credulity. Where's your so, brain waves? Right there. Brain. Oh, hey! Good. What happened with them? Oh, my <laughs> lord. Oh, dear me. It's certainly something very. <clears throat> I shall have to calm down. Ooh, and I cough. This is body movement, yeah. I think you steak. It just turns into a horrible, horrible <laughs> mess, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do apologize. All right. So, this is you doing the task. So what we can see mm. here is there's a um, little bit more alpha activity. It certainly is. Where's the highest spikes. peak? Yeah. Alpha is more the relaxed wakefulness. Oh, you know, this seems such a sane and uh, uh, an excellent project to, you know, people in search of enlightenment and happiness. No one's going to quibble that that's a, 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 an important and valuable quest. Um, and then we, we, we bang into this idea of yogic flying and you think, oh, hello, what's going on here? The people hopping about about in bedrooms, <laughs> looking as if they might be rising off the ground, but not really. Claims which will, will may attract some people, but will t turn others like me completely off. The reason for yogic flying isn't to hop around. It's not a new way to go to the grocery store. <laughs> no, I've got to. Yes. If you yes. go to a much a very fundamental level of the mind, you can ultimately move the body. So if you look at what's happening in the people's brains during yogic flying, just before they take off, there's a huge change. Do you know what motivated the Maharishi to, to come to Iowa? Uh, the college was for sale. I'm not sure what I think of all this, but I do know that Americans seem to be more open than most to anything that might bring about self-improvement. And there is something rather wonderful about the incongruity of yogic flying over the wintry Iowan cornfields. But I have no time and even less inclination to try it out. To the northeast lies Chicago, but first I must make a detour through Indiana and Ohio to Michigan. What to do in Indiana? 
Well, I've always wanted to ride in one of these classic big red fire trucks, and in Elkhart, Indiana, I fulfilled that dream, riding up front with Fire Chief Mike Compton. I'm going to get a taste of what the choking reality is. It's a hard job to get these days. We had uh, 240 applicants for eight jobs. I know when I got hired, I got a three-day training that basically said, follow that guy with the gray hair, keep your mouth shut, and do what you're told. <laughs> I spoke to a farmer once, and he said, oh, yeah, oh, we all love a good blaze. And we do. Yeah. It's, it's kind of funny that if you take an engineer, he wants to prevent a, a building from collapsing. Yeah. Uh, you take a fireman, he doesn't always want to prevent a fire. He wants to have a fire. And that's why you need to weed out the psychologically weird ones who are just a bit too fond of a fire. To be a fireman in the States is to be an authentic American hero, untainted by corruption, politics and ambition. After 9-11, the job became even more glorified and even more desirable. Oh my. Oh my, that's awful. That's just hell. <laughs> There's nothing to describe it. You can't see, you can't orient yourself in any direction. I do not understand how anybody would voluntarily go into a building like that. It's just, now that I've experienced it, I never want to go anywhere near anything like it again. Oh, that stench. The nearly rolling farmland of Ohio. A lot of states have had songs written about them, Georgia, Texas, and California. They're usually rather romantic and optimistic. There's a great song written about Ohio. It's very melancholy, and it memorializes a sort of turning point in American history, really, when the 60s dream went bad. Some students at a university in this state, the town of Kent, part of the state university, known as Kent State, were demonstrating against the Vietnam War, the invasion of Cambodia. And in came the National Guard, kind of soldiery of the American army. And they shot 13 of them, nine very seriously injured, four killed. Young students demonstrating on a campus in a university, shot dead by soldiers of their own country. And it happened in this innocent looking farm state. Great Neil Young wrote a wonderful song about it. Gotta get down to it. Soldiers are cutting us down. Should have been done long ago. What if you knew her and found her dead on the ground? How could you run when you know? over half the states of America so far. We've seen mountains and hills and rivers and beautiful cities. We're here in Detroit, Michigan, Motortown, Motown, where evidence is all around us of the industry that changed the world. Water from the Great Lakes, iron ore from the plains, coal from the Appalachians, and workers from the south and east made Detroit the industrial furnace of America.
Henry Ford, who started his business here in Dearborn on the outskirts of Detroit, could be said to have invented modern America and defined millions of people's lives. His famous dictum that history is more or less bunk is somewhat at odds with the village he created next to his factory, a village full of history, pillaged from every corner of the planet. But people are ever complicated and contradictory, which the best machines are not. The Model T he built here on the first ever mass production line is still considered the most successful car ever made. Simple, effective, elegant, cheap enough to be bought by Ford's own workers. The Tin Lizzie quite simply transformed the world. But Ford was not alone in the car business here, and Detroit is home to the largest car company of all and Ford's bitterest rival. General Motors, makers of the Chevrolet, Pontiac, Buick, and Cadillac brands. In the stylish tech center built by that modernist master, Aero Saranin, I meet up with John Manugian, designer of the latest incarnation of the Cadillac. When I first saw the 1963 Corvette Stingray, I rode my bicycle into town that day to the Chevrolet dealer, and they had a silver Stingray sitting right in the showroom. I said, that's it. I have to be where they designed that car. You really wanted this job, didn't you? I could taste it. My father worked for 50 years at the Ford Motor Company. When it came time for me to quit my job at Ford and come to Jonah Motors, he was, he was absolutely flabbergasted. He said, why would you ever want to do that? So it's a bit like someone from a very strict Catholic family bringing home a Protestant girl. Actually, in some ways, it was probably worse than that. <laughs> now you've designed yes. a Cadillac. That, I mean, did you ever dream that that My would... life is complete. If you were to gaze into your crystal ball, what, what would you see motoring being like in another 20 years, say? Um, I would expect to see uh, smaller cars, uh, probably different power plants. In this country, being the way it is, laid out as big as it is, um, there's going to be a large segment of, of the population that says, I have to have a car. America needs cars. For the foreseeable future, there's no alternative. Hell, I'm using one because it's the only way to see the country, save for those few moments when I can get a bird's eye view. And what a view. Chicago, Illinois, the windy city, second city to New York, a hard-working, wealthy metropolis built on the shores of Lake Michigan, and a magnificent hymn to modernism. Chicago is also home to its very own style of the blues. Yes, I don't drink because I like it, no, no. And Buddy Guy is their god. I'm just trying to eat my worry, my... From Jimi Hendrix to the Stones to Eric Clapton, they've all worshipped at the frets of his guitar. If you see me get kind of drunk... <coughs> Please don't pay me no mind. But the blues are a dying art form. Buddy Guy takes me down memory lane to the once thriving working class south side of the city. This is the place of the most famous blues club on the south side of Chicago. This vacant lot here, another one called Jimmy Mitch's Jukebox Lounge. This is where they stole my first guitar from right here. Really? Yeah. Uh -huh. Good. And it's now just That's wasteland. It. Just wasteland. With ice on it. So I used to live around the corner. I'd leave home to go to Pepper's Lounge. I never made it, because every time I would pass a, a joint like that, I could hear the music loud playing. And I'd say, wow, this sounds so good. I got to go see who this is. When I walk out there on this side of the street, same thing. That side, this side, they had blues clubs, so I mean, everywhere. I don't even hardly come down this way no more because I hate that flashback 
Yeah. Those things it are gone. You. Oh, yeah, you know, it's, uh, sometimes you feel like crying because, you know, what happened? Because people was having so much fun. I mean, 24 7. It saddened me because I, those days are never, never coming back. Tell me what the reason you keep on teasing me. I mean, some people laugh at the place and they say it's always about being miserable. What do, what do you think they're about? When you hear B.B. King saying, I got a sweet little angel, I love the way she spreads her wing, that is not miserable. Entertainment has always been a big part of this city, and while the blues clubs may have passed away, one institution that has gone from strength to strength is comedy theater Second City. Comedy improvisation could be said to have come of age at this institution. For half a century, some of the greatest and most famous comedians in the world have started their careers here. Your girlfriend's in there right now. Oh, great. I haven't seen her in a while. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> um, uh, uh, how can I tell this? <laughs> uh, she's, uh, <laughs> uh, lost her clothes. <laughs> oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe she went out here for five minutes. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. All right, two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear, what I was most dreading, my turn. Would you be offended if I said that you seem to me to be in every way the visible personification of absolute perfection? Oh. <laughs> that makes my boy and girl parts go all over twice. You are radiantly lovely, you do know that. <laughs> what is the sexiest word that comes to your brain right now when you look into my eyes? Strabismus. <laughs> the Wiener Circle is an institution among Chicago's acting fraternity, and having recovered from the trauma of last night, I'm to be initiated. Yeah, I'll have a big wiener. Yes, Two big wieners. No, definitely no hot peppers. I'm, I'm completely homosexual when it comes to hot peppers. And the authentic Chicago experience. Improvise your way out of that. <laughs> ah. Mm. Oh. Yes. Surprisingly delicious. Mm -hmm. Now listen, Second City. It was the end of the rainbow for, for you if you had comedy ambition. The first time I saw a show, I was just like, I want to be on the stage so bad. Really? Yeah. You get hired and you go inside and they show you there's a tape closet with the tapes of all the shows that they've ever done and oh, the scripts oh, from all those amazing. shows. And they open it up and you look at the cast list and it's like, you know, you look, it'll be uh, Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Gilda Radner in one show, you know? Dan Castellano used to work here, you know, well, the Homer Simpson. Homer Simpson, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the like legendary seven. Homer Simpson. Oh. If, from the vantage point of my elderly position of a 50-year-old, I can offer any advice, it is that it is never too late. That the idea that the door closes and, oh gosh, I'm already 30, nothing's happened. Right. It's complete nonsense. Actually, you know? it's almost the reverse is true. That yeah. A, yeah. a lot of the stars, I mean, George Clooney, that guy Hugh, the one in house, whatever his name is. Yeah, um, he's you know, terrible, right? He's, yeah, he's had to wait till he was late 40s before. What, why do you think it grew up here in Chicago? Is there something about this place? The city just happened to be hungry for it. It's called the Windy City because in the 19th century, uh, they were, uh, the, they, they said that the politicians in Chicago were full of hot air. Oh, is that? It's windy in that sense. Yeah. yeah. The kind of windy person is like, a, like a blowhards. windbag. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Blowhards, yeah. as you call them. Exactly. And, uh, and they had that reputation because they also had the reputation of being the second city. They were second to New York all the time. And it's always kind of had that chip on its shoulder. But since it's such a working class town, it doesn't mind having that chip. It's always working. Yeah. It, it never rests. There's yet another sector of the entertainment industry in Chicago, but in a different, how shall I put it, mold. Real copper, so beautiful. Okay. Oh, here's the big one. Here's the big one. Gold. That little gold one. Oh. Okay. Yep. 
Gold, Mr. Bond. I love its softness, I love its beauty, I love its colour, but most of all, I love its value. Yeah. It's the real thing, it's an Oscar. never did get my Oscar, but I got this instead, one of the greatest sights on the planet. The Sears Tower, for a long time, could proudly call itself the tallest building in the world, but the economic shifts of the last decades have moved that dubious accolade to the Far East. But who's counting when you have this? Leaving Illinois on my way to Minnesota, I head into state number 30, Wisconsin. So, here we are in Wisconsin. And a thing I ought to tell you, which you may not be able to tell yourselves, is that it really is very cold. It's exceptionally cold. A few hours ago, it was minus 25 degrees centigrade, which is jolly cold in anybody's currency. And I have proof of it because I had a bottle of water which I had last night left in the cab and as you may be able to see that is one solid completely frozen bottle of water. Ah, very pretty there. Very Scandinavian around here. Jensen motors and things you see. Uffa de Mart. Sorensen's auto sales. For most Americans, Wisconsin means cheese. Most of it disgustingly bland and fit only for melting over burgers. But Brenda Jensen is a rarity. She makes organic ewe's milk cheese. She has 150 sheep herself, but she still needs more milk as her successful business expands. Brenda's desire for unadulterated milk leads her to equally unadulterated Amish neighbors. The Amish are a Christian sect who don't believe in mechanical devices, so don't use cars, tractors, phones, or shavers. They also don't like being filmed, but take it from me, they're very friendly and sweet and not in the least solemn or disapproving. <laughs> They're very keen to be milked, aren't oh, they? Oh, yes. Wait, now we've got, to do it. we've got all these udders presenting to we us. Do. Oh, yeah. Yep, yep. Okay, darling, I'm going to have a go. Excuse me. Oh, Lord. Nice, Hang on. You've got. Come on, look. Ow. Oh, that's one. Where's the other one? Oh, get out. Bloody hell. There Taste it goes. It right out. Yep. There it goes. There's the milk. Oh, my, and that flows up into one of these pipes. They certainly like to present their um, lady parts, don't they? They, <laughs> they do. There's no mistaking. Obviously attractive to a ram. So many things going on there. The folds and puckers and <laughs> oozies. <laughs> oh, oh, what's going on? They've recently had babies. Every, you know, in so here. they're a little, so, yeah, yes, yes, a little yes. stretched at the moment, yep. darlings, aren't you? Yeah, a little slack. Mm -hmm. Take your finger. Oh my goodness! And oh, yeah, just take oh, a break like, like a, that. That's you can tell like that the cheese is ready. Wisconsin. I mean, is it thought of as a very much a, a, a capital of, of good dairy farming? Oh yes, very much so. Wisconsin is cheese. I have to say to you, without wishing to be offensive about America, mm -hmm. but one of the most notable things about America is that cheese, generally, is appalling. Mm. 
apps. I mean, it's shocking. You go to a, even a, quite a good restaurant. And, oh, sure. And a, they don't serve it, but and the and the cheese they melt and mm. put on things is yeah. just it's it's orange. And some we're of it learning. comes out of a can. Yeah. Um, spray on cheese. It yeah. exists, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does. So this is it's just like a new movement in America. It is. It really is. It's more artisanal, farmstead, um, artisanal, natural. That's a good word. Yeah. It, it it is, and very handcrafted. By Midwestern standards, my next destination, the twin city conurbation of Minneapolis St. Paul, is bang next door, being only a couple of hours' drive away. Mississippi, there she is again, look. Almost frozen solid. We've hardly left her for two and a half thousand miles since we met at the mouth in Louisiana. And now, ten states later, we've traced her almost to her source further upstate in Minnesota. It's even colder up here in Minnesota than it was in Wisconsin, so there's barely a soul on the streets. In fact, almost no one ever braves the air in wintertime, and to get from building to building, they have covered catwalks between the buildings called skyways. It's those practical Scandinavians again. But hark, that's not Swedish, I hear. It's Mon. And how odd to be among the Hmong, so far from their ancestral homelands, which were in the opium-growing hills of Laos and Vietnam. These are the latest and probably most incongruous in a long line of immigrants to Minnesota. The Hmong fought alongside the Americans during the Vietnam War, and after that war was lost, most of the Hmong refugees who fled to the U.S. were resettled here in Minneapolis. Today, they number some 40,000 and are the largest Hmong community outside Southeast Asia, with their own state senator, Mrs. Mi Mua. If you came from a village life where people are out and about and teeming and people are walking the, the roads and the streets and you're always bumping into people, to come into this environment in the middle of January where you don't see human beings for months and months and months, and the only people you see are your family. But you, you look outside and you don't see anybody. It's like a ghost town. Soon after the Hmong were moved here, there was an unusually high number of deaths among their men folk. Senator Mee explains. Many, many Hmong men who would go to sleep and just die in their sleep. They just switched themselves off almost. They, they stopped wanting to live and so they didn't live. It's a kind of suicide. Just yeah, the light just went out. And, you know, the, 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 the irony is that we I have talked to men who have come back. They would dream that they have wings and that they're flying, you know, across the oceans. And they would see the fields and the mountains of Laos. You know, to go back to the land of the ancestor. So these people who woke up, um, woke up because their wives heard them kind of struggling. Otherwise, he was already in Laos. You know, we started to have Hmong grocery stores. We had Hmong uh, uh, loan officers and bankers at the local banks. You know, we had enough people who were versatile in English to be at, the, at law offices and at hospitals that has really helped to minimize the sense of helplessness. We could have a sense of community. Leaving the now happier Hmong to their adopted homeland, I join up with Tim Lesmeister for a spot of more traditional Minnesotan activity. Whoa, that was fun. Oh, that was a good ride. Whoa. Whoa. Uh, quite icy on the ice. Right here where we're standing, there's there's literally thousands of fish below us ready to be caught. <laughs> hey! How thick is that sheet of ice, do you think? That's 24, 26 inches right in there. Over two foot. I usually bring nothing but bad luck to these kinds of <laughs> enterprise, but uh, <laughs> let's see if we can catch something. Just to get this straight, you're, you're putting a television camera down I'm there. putting a camera down here, yes. <laughs> and we'll set it up so that we can actually watch our lure, and we'll be able to watch the fish actually swim up. 
There's two of them now. Oh, that's a nice fish, too. Okay, come on. Okay, here he comes. Here he comes. <laughs> Ooh, I think he's going to take it. Come on. Oh, he's really on top of this one. Oh, he swam away. Oh, no. Not ringing the dinner bell for him yet. What made Tim and his ancestors settle in this icy land? The Scandinavians actually came over here looking for a, a new life, but when they got to Minnesota, they said, this is just like home. Yes. Well, let's stay here. The, the people in Minnesota tend to be a little quirky. I suppose you have to be if you're going to uh, be crazy enough to, to live this far north. <laughs> Come on, fishy. Yeah. These fish are really negative. They're oh. toying with us. They know that we want one so bad. If we didn't want a fish. Yeah, that's true. That's not one. If we yeah. didn't want a fish, we would catch a fish. Actually, it would be rather a bore that's right. if they bit, that's because right. I'd have to turn the reel and bring them up. So I'd much rather you just go away, please. Bother someone else. That's right. See how this reverse psychology works. That's right. Ooh, ooh, big bass, big bass. Don't you? Bass. Big bass, big bass, big bass. Oh, that would be Where's good. That line? Where's that line? Big bear, come on, come on. Oh! Really, man? Oh, Yay! it's a sunfish. That's <laughs> actually a nice one. What is he? That is, that is a sunfish. Uh, he's beautiful. Yeah, that's a beautiful fish. Cold, that means come ready frozen <laughs> virtually. <laughs> I mean, this is probably the biggest fish ever caught in this lake, would you no, say? It's a no, record no, no, fish? No, no that, that. Oh, come that, on, yes, it is. Oops. <laughs> oh, dear. It's the first fish I've caught since I was about 10 years old. So this is? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not scared of it, Tim. I don't want you to think that I'm scared of this fish. Oh, this is a nice one. Isn't this that? is a serious fish. Is... That's okay. bending. This I'm, is I, this I, is I... really bending the rod. Oh, yeah, it's a piggy. He's up to the hole. He's up. He's up. He's up. Oh, I say, brother, that's a that's a that pike, isn't it? That is a pike. Yeah, he's a, absolutely beautiful. That is a that is a beautiful fish. I th I would go as far as to say that was bigger than the fish I just caught. <laughs> I think I think it is. I uh, genuinely think that's bigger than my fish. I'm guessing it was pretty yeah. close. Pretty close. You, actually, it's, it's mine close. goes from there to there. Yours goes. Yeah, yours is just bigger. Well done. That's a that's a nice big fish. There it goes. Off she goes. Oh, that's Off wonderful. I, that's... I like to see them put back. That is really good. These are the spoils pitting our wits against the mighty sunfish. Oh, this is brilliant. It's been quite a journey from the Gulf of Mexico and New Orleans, where the river Mississippi empties itself in warm, steamy, torrid Louisiana, right here to fresh, chilly Minnesota, which is the state where the Mississippi begins. We followed music and food. That's slightly worrying. That's just ice cracking. Oh, that's ice cracking. Sorry. Oh, that's all right. I thought it was a leaf rustling. If it's only ice cracking. Get out of here! And so we did. Next week, I shall be traveling from the glaciers of Montana on the Canadian border right down through the high prairies and rocky mountains to the arid deserts of Texas on the border with Mexico. <laughs>